Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So this is an election year. So we may be spending some time talking with those people who are running as out candidates yeah. at all levels of the races. Perfect. So, so for today, please welcome Thomas Renner, who has decided that they would like to run in the Democratic primary for Lieutenant Governor. So welcome. Hey, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the invite. So I, I want to start with, you know, I, I read your bio associated with the campaign. Yeah. And you are not a Vermonter by chance. You <laughs> deliberately wanted to be a Vermonter. So exactly. could, you, could you share that story? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, yeah, you know, I am one of those people who has made Vermont my chosen home. It was an, an effort that I definitely undertook. Um, so my um, my parents are divorced. My dad lives in South Burlington. So ever since I was a kid, I spent my summers and my winter breaks coming to Vermont and, you know, enjoying both very different seasons and everything that they have to offer. So when time rolled around for, you know, me to start thinking about colleges, it was really just, will I go to Champlain, St. Mike's or UVM? I knew that I wanted to be in Vermont. Um, so, you know, I applied to the three of them um, and decided to go with UVM. It was uh, kind of the best fit for me for, you know, financial reasons, the programs they had. So did did four awesome, awesome years at UVM. And then, you know, another choice, I made another choice to stay here I, out of the college that I was in, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. There weren't many of us that stayed in Vermont. Most most people, and especially in my friend group, I was the only one who stayed in Vermont. Everybody else moved to Boston or New York City or L L.A. And um, I had interned for Senator Patrick Leahy and just before graduation. And I was like, no, like, I really want to stay here. Going to see if I can find a job in Vermont. And I started looking around for different jobs. And um, I think it was, you know, just a couple of weeks after graduation, I got a call from Senator Leahy's um, state director. And he said, Thomas, we really want to interview you and see if you want to work in the office. And I was like, sure, definitely uh, interviewed with them. And I started um Right after July 4th weekend, actually, back in 2014, uh, started my career working for Senator Leahy. And, um, you know, even during when I was working for him, thought about going down to D.C. a couple times, see if I wanted to do the D.C. staffer thing. Uh, thankfully, I just got to travel there a lot and I didn't have to leave Vermont. And now I'm living in Winooski with my husband and our dog and uh, some chickens. And we can't really um, envision ever leaving. So, so chickens, you're you're maintaining your agricultural degree <laughs> and putting it into practice. Exactly. Okay, so when you were working with Patrick Leahy, did that yeah. sort of give you a taste of politics and you said, you know, I want to do more with this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, when, so I'm a, I was a communications major at UVM and I thought I was going to do, you know, public relations or marketing, something like that. And as I was at UVM and seeing the career options and I did some, you know, internships in the PR field, I was like, well, this stuff doesn't really matter, you know, like, you know, selling Nike shoes, somebody's got to do it, but it doesn't really matter. And that's why I decided to intern for Senator Leahy. And yeah, while I was there, just seeing, you know, the Senator up front and seeing how he, you know, handled policy, worked across the aisle with Republicans, worked with anybody in the Democratic Party to make sure that he could do the best for Vermonters. I was like, OK, this is this is the way that you can make change and impact your your fellow Vermonter. So, uh, yeah, ever since working for him, I was like, yeah, I think politics is, is what I want to do and be involved in. So were there any specific issues that you worked on? from within Patrick's office that you would like to share? Yeah, so one thing, um, the work, you know, you know, Vermont offices do a lot of constituent work. So helping Vermonters navigate federal bureaucracy, which uh, is quite a bit. 
And, um, you know, my, my husband's a veteran and the work that Senator Leahy did for veterans in Vermont is something that I was just so proud to, to be even a small part of that and to assist there. And when I started working for Congresswoman Becca Ballant about a year and a half ago, um, and she asked, you know, what issues I wanted to cover veterans affairs was one of them because it's just so important to take care of the folks who have literally signed up to, you know, give our country everything. Um, Senator Leahy did a fantastic job working with veterans and, you know, writing bills for them, making sure that the VA was protected and enforced. Um, and then, and then the local work is just, it was so amazing to see what we could do. So, um, that's one thing I really took away and, and, and want to continue to do in, in my political service. So did you work with Becca after she was elected and in her office or were you part of the campaign staff? So I was not part of the campaign staff. Um, you know, as a member of the Winooski City Council, I endorsed Becca, showed her around Winooski a bunch um, and really went to, you know, marched a lot of parades with her. And, and that was really great. And that's where I got to know Becca really well. Um, and then again, you know, once she was building her staff, I got a phone call asking if I would like to work in her office. And um it, it it was a great great experience. Okay, so what did you do in Becca's office? Yeah, so um, I covered a variety of issues: uh, climate, energy, um, agriculture, transportation, and uh, veter veterans issues. So, since you were you've mentioned the Winooski City Council, and we're going to circle back yeah, to that yeah. because I I would really like to talk about that experience. So I take it you were in the Vermont office since you were also on the city council. So you would Correct. need to stay close to home. Yeah. 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 They had asked if I'd have any interest in going to DC and I was like, nope, not, not, le not leaving Vermont, but definitely want to be a part of helping Becca do the great work I know she wants to do. Okay. So being a Vermonter was a deliberate process. Yeah. Was picking Winooski as deliberate process? You know, it's a funny story. It is, um, as most folks, we thankfully bought our home before it became really difficult to buy a home in Vermont. Um, so we were looking in South Burlington and, and Winooski. Uh, we had previously lived in Colchester. And um, my, like I had mentioned, my dad and my stepmother, they live in uh, South Burlington. So we kind of thought it might be nice to be close to them. My husband uh, was born and raised in Winooski. So I don't think he necessarily thought maybe that we that he would settle here again. Uh, but we found this great house and fell absolutely in love with it. It's kind of one of those moments where, you know, we we walked in and it was like, oh, this feels like us. And we stepped out back and we could see the dogs running around out back. And we just knew that, that it was where we had to be. I was going to say, you you picked the house for the dogs. I could just tell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 100 100 percent. OK, so. You had an experience with working with Patrick Leahy, with Becca Ballant. Is that what sort of drove you to decide you wanted to run for the Winooski City Council? Or was there something happening in Winooski that made you feel as though you wanted to have more of an active involvement in that process. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, like I had said, I kind of have been seeking, you know, since my internship with Senator Leahy, a way to help Vermonters. And I didn't necessarily know how I was going to get there, but when we were living here in Winooski, I was feeling like I had time. I should be helping more. I should be doing more. And Winooski has this uh, commission set up where, uh, there are various commissions that help advise city council essentially and it's you know it's not a, an office that you run for you apply uh, you get interviewed by city council members and city staff members and then you get appointed so i applied um to be on the safe healthy connected people commission which essentially kind of oversees the fire department the police department um as well as you know city parks and uh the idea is you know trying to make sure that winooski is a city that continues to have a community feeling um, and that was fantastic work, and I really liked it. Um, and each uh, commission is overseen by a member of council. The member of council that oversaw my commission was um, Hal Colston, who was a city councilor and a state representative. Um, Hal was thinking about retirement. He's now retired now. And um, he had mentioned to me that he was going to retire and that, you know, I should consider running for city council because he could see me as uh, somebody who would be good in the role. Um, 
So that's what I did. You know, he, he, he told everyone he was stepping down publicly and I started to launch a campaign and started running. And, uh, thankfully, thankfully the voters of Winooski thought I'd be a good guy on, on council and they elected me and, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> well, I was going to say, not only did they elect you, but with that election, Winooski became one of only three all LGBTQ plus city councils in the country. It actually wasn't that election. It was the election for, it was two years after, a year oh, after. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. So when I came on, um, Councilor Brent Oakleaf, um, who was a queer woman, was already on council. Uh, but there was another gentleman who, um, very fan very, very nice man, but not 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 a member of our community, <laughs> uh, was on council as well. So when I came on, we added another LGBTQ plus person. Um, and then the year, oh, I should say, the year that I came on, Aurora Heard also came on, and she is a member of our community. So okay. it was now three of us. And then there was this one gentleman who was left. Uh, <laughs> he decided to step down uh, the following uh, election season. And then Charlie Judge was elected, um, who's a trans man. And that is how we became an all queer council, uh, which we were so, you know, it had partially been intentional, um, but we were so happy that it happened. So, and this may not be, Is there a difference having an all out council versus some of the traditional councils that we've seen around Vermont? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, when, when this all happens, you know, our articles were coming out on WCAX, Digger, you know, some national articles. And, you know, some of the comments, of course, were, you know, not very tasteful and would, you know, make, you know, for some of just for to be PC, you know, some of the comments were like, it, you know, it doesn't matter that they're queer. Are they actually, you know, good people? And, um, you know, yes, we are all good people and we're all qualified to run for office. And that's why we did it. We happen to also all be a great group of LGBTQ folks. But what I think is really important, um, you know, when you're electing any, you know, minority or marginalized group is we have a different understanding of the world and we've seen the world differently um, and that can correlate to things, right? Like if you are, you know, you know, I, I happen to be gay and black, but you know, for my, you know, for my white queer council members, you know, they may not, they can't a hundred percent identify with the black experience, but they know what it's like to be part of a group that has been held down and you've had to have your voice, you know, has been quietened. Um, so they understand that maybe better than, you know, somebody, you know, than, you know, my white male straight counselors um, who were previously on the board, you know, and not that they can't be allies and not that they can't be champions of, you know, marginalized groups, but they don't have that understanding. And that's really where I see, you know, being a queer counsel is that we have this broader depth of understanding of the human experience because of what we have gone through growing up and what we witness, you know, every day. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to say, you're more inclined to look at, okay, so who is not at the table? Yeah. What is the voice we're not hearing and actively looking for that input versus just accepting, oh, well, this is what we've heard. Exactly. exactly. So I, I also see on your bio that you're the deputy mayor. Yes. <laughs> of Winooski. Okay. So what do, what are your responsibilities as the deputy mayor? Yeah, sure. So it's, um, you know, there's there's definitely a little correlation here between deputy mayor and lieutenant governor. It's uh, almost a very similar role. Um, and, you know, one thing that I'm very proud about, about being deputy mayor, it's usually a role that is given to the person who served longest on council. Kind of like if you think in the United States Senate, the pro tem is just, you know, yeah. the, the oldest person there. Um counselors recognized my ability of bringing everyone together you know we've got you know different opinions you know great thing about the queer community right we still have different opinions on how to do things um so we've got different opinions on council folks don't always agree we don't always move forward to the budget in the same way and my fellow counselors recognize that i'm a person who really brings everyone together and puts everybody in the middle where we can discuss and get the best things that everybody wants so they recognized that and they said, yeah, he should actually be a leader of our council. 
So, you know, the, the, the real role of the deputy mayor is to step in if the mayor isn't available, you know, whether that be that she is out of town <laughs> on vacation or whether it be, you know, something worse. Um, so what that means is I have an incredibly cr close relationship with the mayor as well as with city staff. So I always need to be ready in case the mayor isn't going to be available. And, you know, and I also take um, the deputy mayor role as a leadership role and leading my fellow counselors. I created programs where uh, getting, you know, to me, it seems uh, kind of like a no brainer, but it hadn't really happened before. Getting council out into the community. Council really only existed inside City Hall, you know, at 6 p.m. on a Monday until, you know, whatever hour we, we were there till. Um, and that's not exactly the most approachable way for most people to approach their government. Uh, you know, 6 p.m. is dinner time for a lot of people, especially parents. Um, not everybody feels comfortable going into City Hall and sitting down and having to come up to a microphone and talk to these people that you don't know. So I got us out into coffee shops. I got us out into bars. I got us out into the different events happening in the parks and saying, yeah, here we are. This is your city council. We're out where you can find us. Um talk to us, engage with us. And um, it's it's a program that's gone really well. Council has appreciated the, uh, the emails I send them, reminding them to get out to places and organizing, you know, coffees with council and things like that. And I think it's enabled our community uh, to be more in touch with council and more in touch with what we're dealing with uh, every day. So building off that, you're in a primary race, you're not the only candidate. Correct. If if I'm looking to who to give my vote to, yeah. Why should I give it to you? It's a very good question, and it's, it's what I keep talking to people about. So, you know, there are, there are many reasons why I'm running. Um, one of the reasons being in Vermont, we do a lot of talking about empowering young people about wanting more diversity, um, you know, diversity being, you know, both on the color of people's skin as well as the diversity of their experiences where they come from. Um, I think it's time for us to walk that walk, not just talk about it. Let's elect a leader who is diverse, both in the color of his skin and in his experience, and also is, you know, younger than the average politician. At the statewide level, we have nobody who looks like me or has had the experiences that I've had. Um, you know, I'm a working class guy. My dad was a teacher. My mom uh, ran a neighborhood bar. Um, I'm black. I'm gay. I have seen and experienced things that are very different than most of our statewide candidates um, and are closer to what the average Vermonter has experienced day to day. Um, on top of that, in Winooski, we have done such great work at becoming an economically exciting city we are building we are creating spaces for new businesses and that's what we need to do across the state we need to make our main streets great streets and that's something that we've we've done well in Winooski we have this great model um, there's more that we can do we want to build more we want to bring more people into Winooski because uh, we know that people want to come here and people want to stay here and move to to different types of homes um you know, if we had more land in Winooski, I could only imagine what we would have done by now. Um, but I think that the model that we've done here is a model that can be copied across the state. Every single state has a little downtown, and all of those downtowns could be built up with with homes and with uh, spaces for businesses uh, to create that community, uh, that community economic thriving model that we really need. Um, we know that we need more Vermonters to, sorry, more out of staters to move to Vermont and become Vermonters. Um, we have an aging population and we need to replace that. Um, the only way we can do that is if we build. So, um, you know, I don't expect every town and city across Vermont to end up looking like Winooski, but maybe miniature versions of it. So I hear an implied reference to creating affordable housing and outreach you know, sort of promoting this is who Vermont is and don't yeah. you want to become part of our community. When you become Lieutenant Governor, what is your top priority? Well, my top priorities are, because there's a lot of them, but the top ones are, are housing and affordability. And I see them tied into so many things. You know, we, we all talk about housing, but what I really think is interesting is how it ties into 
many of the problems we have in Vermont. You know, we have a healthcare provider shortage. Uh, what's a big part of that shortage? The hospitals across Vermont recruit great doctors and nurses to come here, and then their contracts get up to the point where they're about to move and they can't find anywhere to live. Um, we can build a fort we need to and must build more affordable housing. But as it turns out, a doctor doesn't qualify for affordable housing. So we need to talk about building all types of housing. Uh, we need affordable housing. We need middle market housing. We need housing for people with a lot of money. And what we really need as well is housing for um, elderly folks that is before they transition to a you know nurse skilled facility. There are folks uh, living right here in Winooski that I've spoken to who are in their 70s, living in the home that they brought their family up in, four bedroom, three bathroom home kind of thing. And it's just them, you know, two of them are one person sitting in this home and they don't wanna be there anymore. They don't wanna upkeep this big four bedroom house, but there's nowhere for them to go um, in, an, in, a, in a setting after that. So they just, they stay there. Um, so we need to be building all types of homes and it ties into so many different issues. Once we have more, more homes here, home prices will go down. People can move to Vermont. People who are in apartments can say, oh, they're actually building homes for you know, working class uh, people to buy. We can finally own our own home and start building equity and start growing our personal economics. Um, the housing crisis ties into so much, so it, it has to be my top issue, and I, I it should be every politician in Vermont's top issue as well. Okay, and with that, I'm looking forward to seeing you out on the parade route, <laughs> talking with you at the Corner Cafe, Yeah, and being able to vote in the primary. Yeah, yeah, I've been on some parades already. Um, I did, I've marched parades for years because there's always been candidates that I've been interested in, you know, done parades with Senator Leahy, Congresswoman Ballant. Um, I didn't realize how exhausting it was being the person in front of the banner, running around, handing out candy and shaking hands. So I was exhausted after Memorial Day, and um, but I, I, I really love parades. I think it's a great way to like get out and see people. Um, and it's just it's just fun, right? Like who doesn't love like you see all these kids excited for the candy that you're gonna give out and it's just a good day. And and people remember he shook my hand, he and he talked to me. Yeah. So and the impact that that has. Okay, with that, we will make sure that you know we we get your campaign side up. So if there are people right. who want to become more actively involved. Yeah. Or perhaps put a lawn sign in front of their home. <laughs> yes, there, they is, have a, a there mechanism is a section on the that. website for lawn sign requests. <laughs> and and you may have already gotten one. So, <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So with that, thank you. And I look forward to our next interview. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody out there. I'd like to introduce you to Polo Mutino, who is running for governor. We're very excited to have you on the show. So everybody say hi to Polo. Uh, they've had a lot of um, activity in um, the area and I happen to know Polo from being uh, working at the senior center uh, as <clears throat> meals program manager. So that was that's one of his uh, their jobs here. Uh, Fire and Ash, Pancakes for the People, which is very exciting, Grassroots Fund, Colors of Trans Expression, Graduate Assistant, Another Way, which is in Montpelier, uh, and your education is you went to Barry University School of Social Work in Miami, Florida. Um, and Sterling College, Crestbury, Vermont. Um, you've won awards, the St. Catherine Award of S Social Justice Service from Barry University and Dean's Honor Award from Barry University. So welcome, Poa. Um, so I have a few questions for you. Okay. Okay. So of all the things you could have done, why governor why did you decide to run 
I had a formative last week of March, and one of the first things I did that week was go to a youth walkout from Montpelier High School for Palestine. And I listened to the youth speakers at the mic, and one of them in particular, whose name is Veda, uh, said, one, that if you're a feminist and you're not outraged at what's going on in Palestine, then you need to look again at your feminism. And she went on to say this about a number of other um, intersections, and I really found her to be um, just spot on. And she said that there wasn't anybody um, in the state house who she felt like represented her. And later that week, I went to hear Senator Sanders speak at the Waterbury Area Senior Center. Um, and then I went to see Beth O'Brien's film, Just Getting By. And I also went to the outright um, day of leadership at the State House. And all of this youth energy and all of this older adult energy were sort of saturated my week. And at the end of the week, I asked my um, boss, I said, do you know if there's anybody running to oppose Phil Scott for governor this year? And he said, not that I know of. And uh, by the next week, uh, which was the week of my 34th birthday, I decided that I would be governor one day. And then I, a couple of days later, decided that I would try this year um, in order to build the BAME recognition and a base of support. And why governor? I think it's because it's a, it's a position of such leverage and power and with the right transformative leadership, a lot can get done hand in hand with the legislature. And, um, I think um, I think this young person really had it right um, in saying that uh, she wanted more representation, and and then as someone who feels very called towards service of older adults, um, I've been faced uh, with their economic realities in my uh, past year and eight months of being a senior meals program manager, um, and I'm hearing how unaffordable living is. Um, and a lot of that having to do with property tax increases and the cost of living increasing while uh, benefits remain stagnant. Um, so I bring a systems level analysis as a social worker. I think a social worker would make a great governor, um, just the way we, we think and are trained. And um, I want to give Governor Scott a run for his money uh, because I think I have some visionary ideas and an ability to really listen to people um, and uh, think critically that um, uh, my strengths, I think, may uh, or do um, outweigh uh, some areas where he hasn't been strong and new leadership can uh, bring us into an even stronger state. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready for new leadership. Um, he's not going to be easy to beat. Uh, but as you say, you'll gain recognition and name, and um, I think that's a good thing. Um, so if you could sit down with any politician, living or dead, for like a couple of hours, just to pick their brains about what they would do and how they would do it, who would it be? I, having just given this, this moment's thought, think that Nelson Mandela would be an honor and privilege to talk to. Um, I heard an analysis of politicians, of him being one who whose integrity didn't change once he gained political office. And he had um, apartheid to address as like the primary trauma of the people who he was elected to serve. Um, and I think we I think I would just have the most to learn uh, from him uh, of anybody in recent memory that I can think of who took political office um, for the grit that um, he has he has in his character and the enormous responsibility of being a spokesperson and a leader um, with so much racial division and class division uh, and atrocity that. Um, South Africa experience. It's a great one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as you know, Vermont has a 20% population of people 65 years and older. 
And, you know, one of the problems I think that, you know, maybe you could, you know, address this issue along with that is that a lot of older people would move out of their houses if there was a place for them to go. And so part of the problem is like young people can't buy houses because people are hanging on to them because there really isn't any place affordable for them to go when they sell their home. So they just stay there. So, you know, how, how would you address this issue? And how would you get older people to um, vote for you? Well, you just posed a great a solution within a problem of uh, homes that are sometimes too big for the older adults living in them. And then younger families who need homes, period, of any, you know, there's just an absolute shortage of housing. So, uh, and I've heard older adults in uh, the Montpelier area say that they um, can't afford to stay, but they also have nowhere to go. And so that's a question that I would pose back to um, older adults through uh, polling and, and conversation and listening sessions like Senator Welch and Sanders do. Um, and, and find out, um, if we are to build housing that is centered on the needs of older adults, uh, where should it be? How congregate do people want to live? How much independence do they need? Um, I think, um, already, um, a lot of folks like to, uh, come into town where they're close to services, such as the grocery store, the pharmacy doctor's offices um and so and, and also really having in aging in mind for urban development it's so overlooked and i saw this beautiful quote um that if we made our cities aging informed everybody would enjoy them mm -hmm. if an older person can navigate a space with ease um, it's going to make it easier for everybody else to navigate that space um, easily. Um, so that's not a question um, so much about housing, but more about just how, how we're thinking about and designing um, spaces. And uh, in order to fund the solutions to the housing crisis, one idea that I was thinking about with Christine Hallquist um, the other week was a tax credit for wealthier Vermonters. Um, if portion of their money can go if and when they spend money on affordable housing. So building more, I believe in lifting certain restrictions um, so that urban housing, it can be built more quickly with less permitting, um, not still while still protecting the, the integrity that um, Act 250 um, has afforded our state in its history. Um, yeah, and, and the thing is that Vermonters really care about each other. And I think that we are often in a scarcity mentality. Um, and um, we can think more about our strengths than about uh, what we don't have um, as we come together to solve um, housing as, as a major state issue. And interestingly, the number one issue when polled for Vermonters this legislative season is taxing. So keeping folks feeling safe in themselves and their finances that the uh, state is not going to increase taxes in order to solve problems, but finding ways where people who can't afford to pay more taxes will not pay more, but people who can't afford to pay more do in order to solve these, these intense problems of the day. And, you know, there is a, um, I know that Vermont has like, if you're under a certain income, you don't, you pay less in taxes. Uh, there is some of that, but there are some states that have. Um, once you reach sixty-five, your taxes will never go up again. Um, it'll always be at the rate you paid. You pay at sixty-five until you either sell the house, or give it up, or you know move somewhere else and sell it. So you know I don't know. It's just like one way other states have found to um, keep, you know, to, to keep the cost of taxes going up on people who can afford, can't afford it. Of course, there are many people 
in uh, who aren't seniors who have the same issue. Um, you'd have to have different resolutions for that, but mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> One thing I'm always interested in, and I, I never quite get to work on it, but um, I'm really interested in what some other states have done, like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, California, Florida, um, have LGBTQ senior housing. Um, and it's, it's, it's senior, but it's also, you know, um, disability, um, Section 8, um, and, and different uh, populations. Um, and I, is that something that would interest you if you were elected governor? It really does. It, it has interested me before my ambition into politics, um, which is um, intergenerational housing and like affinity housing, just like that, because uh, social isolation is as much of um, a shortener of lifespan as uh, any number of um, other health risks. Um, it's like the stress of caregiving, the stress of loneliness will sh make your life shorter and, um, and make the last, your last years, which are meant to be a time of generativity, reflection, giving back, being in community, um, and it can make them so much, so much more painful and, 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 and like I said, stressful. So by bringing people into community, um, we are giving them another, another leash on life, leash on life. Um, and uh, so that's something I absolutely would support um, um, incentives for. And um, we know governors can't do everything. And in fact, you know, like people always get the perception that, oh, it's President Biden's fault or it's, you know, this governor's fault or that. We know that you can't do everything as governor. You have to work with the legislature. Um, and fortunately, we have at least somewhat of a progressive um, legislature here. But how would you, how would you feel you'd work with the legislature? Would you... To say, you know, hey, somebody, can you uh, sponsor this bill? Or would you just sort of uh, hope that people do and promote that, those different programs? So how would you work with the legislature? And where would you get the money? You know, that's the thing, uh -huh. you know? Well, my attitude toward the legislature would be one of just like the spirit of enthusiasm. Um, I think it's a shame right now that Governor Scott is drawing these adversarial lines um, and, and saying that the legislature is doing things that are going to harm Vermonters and that we should vote in more moderate legislators who will get along with him better. But instead, I'm looking at him and his the power of the fact that he's not just one person. He has an executive team, a budget for that team. I would be, I'm a realist also. So whatever legislation that the House is working on, I would be asking how I can support them, seeing things from my own perspective, adding my views. I would want the legislators to be as amenable as possible to the executive team and the expertise that, of the different people um, that I would have the opportunity to hire so that we are, I'm like a shepherd for these different bills. Um, I want the best ones to pass to my desk so that I can proudly sign them. And I want it to be no surprise if I'm going to veto something because it will be, I will have done my, everything in my power to ensure that something better didn't reach my desk. Um, so, or something that, things, everything in my power to ensure that something better did does reach my desk than something that I, I'm forced to decline uh, passing this year. Um, for example, the pollinator bill. Uh, that came up around an agricultural chem uh, pesticide that affects seeds for corn. Um, this is something that Quebec and I believe Vermont have already uh, had this legislation and banned this pesticide mm -hmm. or fungicide. I haven't looked at it again recently. Um, if and, and so Governor Scott vetoed it saying it didn't protect the farmers enough. 
Right. But he just had the whole session in which he could have been helping that legislation be stronger to protect the farmers. Uh, so I just, I don't, there's some things where uh, these red, red flags go off for me with the, the, the things that he says where I'm like, but isn't that in your control to some degree to make the best legislation possible during the legis whole legislative session so that you have the ability to pass things proudly into law yeah. as something that you collaborated on. So what will you do on day one? Besides jump up and down and say hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good question. I mean, I'm I'm a pr practitioner of somatics, so I'll just be like paying attention to my body, taking it slow. Um, I will have already had a whole period of time of being elected until my first day to make plans. So I will be surrounding myself with an exceptional team and starting off day one with communication and a press release and letting uh, a press conference, letting everybody know um, what I'm here to do and, and that I'm here for them. As a social worker, I think about people as clients if they're uh, um, looking to me for services. And so I would have suddenly 600,000 clients, 20% of whom are older adults. And I, it would be my responsibility to be the best leader uh, possible for everybody. And um, how would people get in touch with your campaign if they want to help or donate money or whatever services, telephoning, banking, and, you know, driving you around the state and, you know, convertibles with flags and you know whatever how would yeah. they get in touch with you through my website uh is the clearing house for all of that so there's buttons to sign up buttons to contribute um t-shirt not yet order your as soon as somebody wants to be just right first i need a donation i need a, a t-shirt fairy or sponsor um okay. hundred dollar budget and then we'll get you everybody a t-shirt um uh, yeah, we have a great a, a great graphic designer. Tepi has uh, donated their services, and uh, uh, so I have the logo and everything ready to print. Um, but honestly, this campaign, I'm having more not enough money come in, uh, so I need need donations um, in order to do exciting, fun things like advertise the campaign. So, so what uh, is your website? Poamutino for Vermont dot com. Okay, we'll have we'll flash that across the screen so that people can see it and hopefully send in lots of checks. I don't know, but um, there's an address for checks on the website too. Yeah, and and uh, when is the show um, airing? The show will air probably in not this week, but next. Okay, next weekend, not this weekend, but next. If it's uh, before. Sunday at 9 a.m. from 9 a.m. to or 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. in front of City Hall that we're doing a Father's Day pancakes for the people. Uh, so, I love that. <laughs> it airs before that. I'm inviting dads to come join me at the griddle. Free pancakes for dads. Mm -hmm. um, so are you going to go running around the state soon or? Yeah, absolutely. I'll be at Rutland, Count Rutland City Pride, Northeast Kingdom Pride. Um, Fourth of July, you're going to be in? Third of July parade. Third of July, with yeah. Boot yeah. And pancakes. <laughs> um, and uh, more dates to be booked soon. Um, I definitely owe uh, the voters um, in every state a visit. Um, so, in every state, in every county is what I meant to say. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I'd like to especially uh, focus time where the most people are, like Chittenden and Brattleboro, uh, but also uh, not leave any any place unvisited that doesn't, you know, can host me. Um, where I'm definitely one of our strategies is um, like living room parties, bonfires, cookouts. Um, if there's people in geographies outside of the greater Montpelier area who are willing to host an event and have me come like a meet and greet, um, we love to talk about that too. And you can do one right here in the senior center. You can. <laughs> um, yeah, house parties work well too. You know, everybody has a house party and then they invite other people, right? Exactly. So, yeah. 
Well, Paula, it's wonderful to have you on the show. I wish you all the success. I'm a big fan and supporter. And um, we'll see you soon around the hood. See you soon around the hood, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.